Welcome to our live conversation today, programmed as part of Council's series of live Sunday sessions. I'm Diane Similis, the Curator and Gallery Coordinator of Glen Iris City Council. Today, we are celebrating the art of Erica McGilchrist with our special guests, Linda Short and Norman Rosenblatt. Before we commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation who have traditional connections to the land now known as Glen Ira. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. Today's conversation is a tribute to a remarkable artist, Erica McGilchrist, her creative legacy and artistic accomplishments across close to five decades. Erica worked confidently in abstract and figurative styles was accomplished in diverse mediums and explored environmental, feminist and humanitarian themes in her creative practice. She lived and worked in Caulfield where she was a resident for most of her adult life from the early 70s. Like many women artists working during this period, Erica was under-recognised during her lifetime. The conversation today will readdress this and provide a fascinating insight into Erica's career as an artist, her important role as an art educator and activist for women's art, co-founding the Women's Art Register in 75 and celebrate the important contribution that she made to the cultural life of Australia. So I'm delighted to have Linda Short and Norman Rosenblatt joining me as special guests today. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Linda Short is a curator and writer who's based in Melbourne she currently works as a curator at State Library Victoria and previously worked as a curator at Heidi Museum of Modern Art. Linda has developed and managed exhibitions and publications that range in focus from modern and contemporary art through to design and architecture. An ongoing research interest in the work is the work of women artists and she compiled and co-authored the first monograph on the Australian artist and activist Erica McGilchrist for the record published by Heidi Museum of Modern Art in partnership with Lovell Chen in 2019. So Norman, welcome. Norman Rosenblatt is a passionate collector of Australian art and a keen advocate for artists, including Eric and McGilchrist, who he believes were under-recognised during their lifetime. Norman has been collecting art since he was 14 years of age and has a specialist interest in Australian modernism. So we'll move to our first question which is for you, Linda. So, Linda, we know that Erica was born in 1926 in Mount Gambia in South Australia, and her parents encouraged her to engage in creative activities, including art and ballet from a very young age. Can you describe the early formative years of Erica's life, her childhood interest in art and ballet, her training as an art teacher, and then her experience as a member of the avant-garde South Australian dance company, Le Ballet Contemporain. Yes, hi, hi Diane, hi Norman, and welcome to all of our online audience today. Um, so in response to your first question, Erica spent her childhood and teenage years in Adelaide, and from an early age, she showed a talent for both drawing and dancing. So she was incredibly creative, but she was also always quite practical and pragmatic. And so her intention was to become an art teacher to support her creative pursuits. And she'd attended art classes at the South Australian School of Arts and Crafts from about the age of 10, and then went on to train at the Adelaide um, Teachers College in 1945 and 1946. And at that time, she was dancing for Le Ballet Contemporain. So she just started her teaching placements when she was kind of, I guess, swept up by a new style of modern dance. And that actually brought her to Melbourne. So she came for a summer school with the German expatriate dancer, Elizabeth Weiner, who had founded the Modern Dance Company in Melbourne. And Erica was introduced to Elizabeth by Ruth Bergner, who we just saw in image two, represented in one of Erica's works on paper. And Ruth had immigrated to Australia from Poland with her brother, who was the painter Josel Bergner, 
who had become associated with the social realist group of painters, so Noel Cunahan and Vic O'Connor. And the style of dancing that Ruth introduced Erica to was um, this entirely new mode of self-expression. So um, contemporary dance that was sent to contemporary music, dance barefoot and based on improvisation. So this experience for Erica was quite a revelation and she described it as one that really, like a kind of coming of age experience that allowed her to shed years of inhibition. And so she was kind of so compelled by this world that she encountered in Melbourne when she was at this dance school that she decided to stay. And so a holiday in Melbourne became an extended permanent residence. So she never actually returned to Adelaide to live. And Linda, can you talk about the important works that emerged when Erica moved to Melbourne in the early 50s? the works from the Q Mental Hospital series that explored psychological and emotional states? Yeah, so um, I guess when Erica arrived in Melbourne, she's performing, so she stayed on and performed with the Modern Dance Company, but at the same time she enrolled in art classes at the Melbourne Technical College, which is now RMIT, and she took classes in painting, textile design and graphic media. And one of her teachers was Alan Warren, and he really encouraged her to try and be as experimental in her art making as she was in her dancing. And so her first exhibition was in 1951, but she had a solo exhibition that year um, at the Book Club Gallery. And that was actually where Joy Hester had her first solo exhibition a year earlier. Um, and so this opportunity gave her a chance to show some of the works she had been um, creating, which combined her interest in textiles and um, painting and also the graphic arts. So I don't know if we can go back to image four, but um, these were quite experimental murals that she was um, producing. And she called them her movable murals um, because they were displayed by a hanging rod we moved around and they were also machine washable because she developed this technique of being able to heat set the paints. Um, and so they were really well received at her exhibition, but also um, in the modern design world. And she actually sold them at some of the local furnishing stores that were opening up. And they were often displayed alongside contemporary furniture of the time designed by Fred Ward or textiles by um, Ailsa O'Connor. So they were really quite innovative and cutting edge for that time. And then by the time she had her second solo exhibition, which was in 1954, she'd really started to find her feet as a painter. So if we go back to images five, six and seven, they're the paintings from the Kew um, Mental Hospital series. And we can see a really dramatic stylistic shift in her work. Um, and, and particularly a social commentary emerging at that time. So this series that we can see now, it's recording her experiences leading art classes for patients at the then named Q Mental Hospital. And Erica was invited to work there as part of a landmark reform that was led by um, Dr. Eric Cunningham Dax of Victoria's psychiatric facility. So sort of like a, a very early form of art therapy. So, each of these paintings that we're looking at now, they, they portray a scene from the hospital that remained very vividly in Erica's mind, but the images together also carry more of a universal message. So talking about the impact of human suffering that was psychological and also physical. And so at the time people found this imagery, they found it quite um, confronting, quite shocking even the sort of progressive modern artists she was starting to mix with because she was now a member of um, the Melbourne branch of the Contemporary Art Society. She actually helped to reactivate the, that branch in 1953. So that series was an incredibly bold statement um, to talk about art and to talk about mental illness in her art at a time when it was really steeped in stigma and also to publicly present a female voice on that subject seemed even more radical because at that time, women who challenged the sort of patriarchal society um, and systems were often perceived as mad themselves. So 
For me, this series is a really early indication of an artist with a strong sense of social justice, but also an artist who is prepared to stand up and really question some of the established structures upon which society was based at the time. Thanks, Linda. And can I ask you to talk a bit about the important mural commission, The Legend of Being, that Erica received in 1959? Yes. So I guess one thing to say, mention about Erica is that her style was very diverse. And so she allowed the subject matter of her work to dictate, dictate the style that she took. So she moved between um, figuration and abstraction. So um, the images, if we went to image 13 um, first, it shows um, a mural prize that Erica was awarded um, in 1958. And it was a prize that was funded by the um, American cosmetician and entrepreneur Helena Rubinstein. And the prize itself was only open to female artists and that was the wish of the donor. And it was to create a mural for the Women's College, which was a house of residence um, at Melbourne University, that's now called University College. So Erica used this um, very public opportunity, again, to kind of make a major statement um, on society at that time. And she takes kind of one of life's grandest themes, which is the very nature of human existence in that post-war era. So it's called Legend of Being, and there are three panels, and each panel is subtitled. The one on the top left is called Belief, and it's very much a kind of consideration of spirituality and faith. And then the panel on the top right is called Love, and it describes, um, I guess, the creative force of nature through the union of all living things, so not only human beings, but also um, creatures. And then the panel below is called the longing. And this was a kind of meditation on the patterns of social interaction in daily life. But it was such a major undertaking for a woman artist at that time. If we went back to those photographs of Erica, so I think images 12, A through to D, they show her working on the mural. And she had to work in one of the unused science labs at the university because the panels themselves measure about 10 meters in length and she couldn't accommodate them in her tiny home studio. Um, and it took about six months to complete because there were a number of stages she had to go through. So it was quite, it's quite a textural mural. And so you can see her in the images building up the, the surface of the panels and then blocking in the shapes before all of that um, overpainting. So, the mural went on display in 1959 into the dining hall at the college and it stayed on display until 2014. And that's when it underwent um, a major restoration and conservation treatment, which was led by Lovell Chen Architects who um, partnered with Heidi to publish the book on Erica. And the restoration was part of a major redevelopment that they were undertaking of University College. And part of that development was to create a special um, annex for the mural to be housed in from now into the future. Um, and it's really, it's really, the restoration is, has, is beautiful. It's really come back to life. And I think it's fantastic that this work now gets to be on public display for future generations. Thanks, Linda. Now, Norman, um... We know that Erica's works are well represented in many private collections in Australia and overseas, including your own private collection. I know you have a particular interest in Erica's period of abstraction in the 50s and some key works uh, in your collection, including Fire Escape from 56 and some other works that perhaps you'd like to share some thoughts with us today. Yes, well, I, um, unbeknowing as a young Boy, my father's brother was a, um, a friend and um, very fond and I saw the works of Eric at, very, at an early age in his house and um, her imagery and her skill and things that appealed to me stuck with me 
all my life. And um, many occasions I um, saw, saw her works in people's homes and Erica became a um, prominent um, part of my visual life, put it that way. And um, fortunately, I was able to uh, be one of her students and also even more fortunate, I was able to collect some of her work. Um, Erica is a, an artist that um, I won't say that um, she didn't get some accolade, but I can say that she didn't get enough accolade. Um, her abstract um, painting is something that I really um, admire. Um, and she gives you, she, you stand in front of her works, the, the puzzle of abstract to somebody that doesn't understand abstract or does understand abstract is equal. The work is beautiful, it's, um, it's dramatic, and the technique that she uses in this painting 1956 has always amazed me because it's precise, it has, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It has elements of um, roughness on it, and yet it has a lot of daring in it because Erica, in, in some, a lot of her work, uh, I'd say spilt paintings, spilt, spilt paint on some of the paintings and we, we know um, worldly who, who, who's the greatest spiller of paint in the world. But Erica, in 1956, and I, if you look at this picture, there's a lot of work, a lot of paint that found its own way from height. Um, and and, and it, it all works. She seemed to be able to tie a lot of the abstract work together with some beautiful um, brushwork but also the work that isn't precise um, equates beautifully on, on, on the canvas. Um, this, is some, this is a painting that I've always admired. I, I saw it come up many, many years ago um, at an auction and I missed it. And it came up again in Sydney and I saw it and I said, you're not gonna miss it this time. So um, I gathered the painting, it's painted in 1956. And for people that, um, love abstract or admire abstract or like looking at abstract, 1956, this is a pretty good example worldly, not just Australian, but worldly as a, as a painting. Forget about um, where, where it's come from. It is, it'd stand up anywhere in the world of a painting of 1956. Mm. Thanks, Norman. It is a fantastic work. And um, there's an earlier drawing from 1954, Frigidity, from the from a series, Mood series. Are you happy to talk about that and perhaps some of the other works that we can see behind you? Sure. We're, um, are you going to bring the work up? If we bring up image eight. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. it the, the, this is a series, if it's the one I'm thinking about, this is a series of drawings yeah. Um, that are very geometric um, and show an enormous skill. There they are, right, great. They're, they're dramatic, they're geometric. And Eric, this is very early, and, and Erica took this thing of preciseness right through, um, her, I'd say, most of her, 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 her artistic life. But these are very early in 1954. And the amazing thing about these, and I'd seen some of these um, early and they lacked appreciation, but um, people that loved her work and knew this work never lacked the appreciation. But I think if people really want to look at these works and see how clever they are and how brilliant they are um, artistically, but not only that, if you look at the work closely, the frame was made by Clement Needmore. And a lot of Erica never a lot of artists did sculpture. Erica did a lot of things. She she was a realist artist, an abstract artist, she was an illustrator, she did a lot of things. But one thing she never did was having a go at sculpture. And I look at these four, I think there's four of these paintings. They might, Linda can correct me, but I think there's four of them. And these frames were made, and it's like 
marriage in heaven. You, 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 artistically and creatively, the, the, Robert Owen, who's a sculptor that's around now, he always reminds me of Robert Owen's work, who does a lot of geometric work that sits on a wall. Well, these were done in 1954, and I, um, and I, if you took the painting away and you told me they were um, the drawing away and you told me they were Robin Owens, I'd believe you. <laughs> Thanks, Norman. Um, we'll catch up a little bit later on and we'll talk about Erica's influence on, on you when she taught you in the late 60s. But going back to the early 60s, Linda, and that decade of optimism and what an important decade the 60s was for Erica's career. Yes, so um, just to mention one thing about that um, drawing we just saw that Norman was talking about. So Erica actually created that series at the same time with the Kew Mental Hospital paintings. So she was working on those two series in tandem and she exhibited them together in that exhibition I mentioned, which was at Marco Mora's um, studio. And so I think that just shows you how diverse her work could be at any one given time. And so, and they were both, both of those series were looking at the kind of at humanist themes. And um, so even when she was working in an abstract way, the subject of those abstract drawings is um, moods and, and different um, emotions and feelings. So even her abstract works are still very connected to lived experience. Um, and Norman, they're one of my favorite um, bodies of work that she produced as well. Um, so in the 60s, so this is just after Erica's mural commission and she had a, a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art of Australia, which was affiliated with the Contemporary Art Society. Her success really did continue and she received a postgraduate scholarship through the German government's academic exchange service. And this was the first time the scholarship had been awarded to a visual artist and it was to study under the abstract painter Ernest Geitlinger in Munich at the Academy of Fine Arts. So um, she went to Germany in the summer of 59 and I guess she felt a bit, <laughs> a bit of trepidation because she was leaving the fairly um, stable political environment of Australia to a sort of tense um, post-war Germany. However, it turned out to be an incredibly valuable experience and a really intensive period of painting for her. So that shift in place and, and political climate inspired a large body of work. And really she produced what can be broken down into sort of three different series, um, an abstract series that references the landscape symbolically um, and two semi-abstract um, series of paintings that are really about the sort of futility of violence and war. So. When Erica was based there, Germany was still recovering from World War II and you know, it was further destabilized by the Cold War. And it, this sort of environment constantly confronted Erica and her political consciousness definitely intensified at that time. And so with the amount of work that she produced, she was able to hold two solo exhibitions, one in Munich and then one at the Qantas Gallery in London on her way back home to Australia after about three and a half years in Germany. And um, she'd actually gone over to London about a year before she left Munich um, and stayed with Charles and Barbara Blackman who were living there um, by that time. And she worked really hard to secure that um, opportunity to have a solo exhibition in London. She basically carried her portfolio from gallery to gallery until she convinced someone to let her have an exhibition there. And, it, and her determination definitely paid off because the exhibition at the Qantas Gallery was incredibly well received, not only by critics, but by visitors. And on the screen now is one very well-known visitor who turned up at the gallery, at Sidney Nolan. And he and a few other expatriate Australians had heard of Erica's achievements and went to see the works that she had on display. And so this news also reached the press back home. And when Erica arrived back in Melbourne in 1963, um, it really, she sort of was, did she, a whole lot of opportunities opened up for her that she hadn't had before. 
including a number of interstate exhibitions. So even though it was quite a confronting time for her in that I guess it was expanding her worldview when she was in Germany, when she came back, she certainly had gained um, a reputation as an artist to watch. Thanks, Linda. And now, Norman, moving to the late 60s, so you studied at Erica's home studio in St Kilda Road, where she ran a private painting class for adults during this time. Uh, it was also during the abstract art movement in Melbourne in the late 60s and the highly influential exhibition, The Field, staged by the National Gallery of Victoria. So can you talk a bit about Erica's role as a respected mentor and teacher? Um, you talked about her being a really talented and generous educator and how she gave you the key to abstraction and a new way of thinking about art. Well, the, <coughs> excuse me, Erica was um, very free and very um, encouraging in giving information. A lot of artists don't. That's why she was such a good teacher. Um, she gave her wisdom and gave her um, understanding. And if you're willing to receive it and to take it in, it was a great benefit. There's many keys, as I say, there's many keys to art and you can get be handed a bunch of keys, but Erica had the ability to get, get the right key and open the right door. Um, she, um, I, I was always amazed that um, an artist of Erica's um, ability uh, was, worked from a flat in St Kilda Road. I, I can't remember the, the block. I don't know if it's still there and all it's been blown away by a uh, high rise, but I always remember her working on a table in the dining room and um, I was amazed that she worked with not, not, a, not tubes of paint. She did use, use tubes of paint, but she used tins of paint because um, in the 60s, a lot of synthetic paints were being developed in America and she was right up to what, what you could use as, as, as um, paint mediums and also her, her ability to make prints, uh, printing and stabilising print on textiles um, was amazing. As a matter of fact, I have, there's a work that I can point to just over here uh, that was 1967. Um, there it is. It doesn't come up very well. The depth of field not very good on the camera. But it's a top one. And I, I reached, recently that came on the market because the, the family were dis, um, dispersing some of, some of Erica's work. And um, Joseph Albers was doing some of this work in the 60s. And so, so was Erica. Um, she always told me that you interpret what you see and it comes out from within. You don't have to explain what you're doing in an abstract art. It's what, what the result is. Um, it's mostly like making a cake. You can put lots of ingredients in and you put it in the oven and it comes out. And if it, you don't know how it works chemically, but it comes out. And there's not always an explanation. This is one of her later works, um, which I call more um, graphic, but it, it still follows on from 1954, my favorite works. And um, I think there's a lot of artists that work today that um, have looked at this picture or, or, or looked at some of these paintings and um, taken some of the, some of the um, geometry and some of the composition in the works to what comes out of some of the artists today. I won't mention names because all art is, all art continues. It's a body's a body, a, a line is a line. But Erica was right up there, and this is one of this is one of the works. And she was a, 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 a she was Germanic in, in her mark making. There was no error. There was no sloppiness. It was it was really really precise, and it was beautiful. And this this shows you what sort of work she does. One thing she used to tell me though that uh, I never, uh, and I did go to a few other teachers. Um, unfortunately, art never became my profession but it was always my love. Um, she always told me that a painting, um, especially an abstract painting, can look as great whichever way you look at, look at it. If you spin it around and turn it upside down or you turn it sideways, 
it should all ha it should be just as just as great to visually look at it as it is which is whichever way the artist chooses the right way up. Thanks, Norman. And now, um, Linda, we're moving to Caulfield. So Erica moved to Caulfield in the early 70s and painted the important work Trio from the Enigma series and other works which signalled a return to figuration and autobiographical or personal narratives. And then after that, environmental themes. So she was very keen on exploring the destruction of the natural environment in really ambitious in ambitious works from the series The Future of the Planet Earth and, and Less, and key works such as Nature Strip from 76 and Post Near Nuclear Ecology from 77, which are both in the Council's art collection. So there are two sort of questions there. The earlier autobiographical figurative works, and then her exploration of environmental themes. Yeah. Um, so, so that painting you mentioned, Diane Trio, which is image 19, I think, if we could show mm. that image yeah. while I'm speaking, but I think that shows um, some of the big shifts that happened in Erica's work when she came back from Germany. Um, and as, as Norman was just saying, you know, she started to absorb um, these new influences that were around her. So her predominant style of abstract expressionism was sort of falling out of favour. And these new styles, <clears throat> sort of American influence styles of hard edge abstraction and pop art were becoming popular among a much younger generation of artists. But Erica was incredibly versatile and she actually described these new idioms as a breath of fresh air. And so she kind of set about trying to explore them herself rather than sort of being resistant to them. So she stopped using oil paint and started working with the synthetic polymer acrylics. <clears throat> and you can see that as a result, her palette really brightens. So she starts to use a lot of high key color and these kind of radial um, patterns that reflect that psychedelia of the period. And so she'd moved to Caulfield at the same year she painted Trio in 1970. And she purchased a home that became her studio and her classroom, <coughs> excuse me, as well. Um, and when she was settling into the community there, she became um, involved in a grassroots action group, which was um, asking local residents to protest against a local city council pest control program um, that was controlling Argentine ants, and they were using a harmful pesticide or insecticide called Dieldrin. And so Erica was the secretary of the Caulfield Environment Protection Society, and they successfully lobbied the state government to stop using that substance. Um, but her environmental awareness had happened some years earlier. So when she was living in Germany, she there's newspaper clippings in her archive and her papers, which are now held at Heidi Museum of Modern Art, um, that show her on anti-nuclear marches and other sort of protests against um, against the despoilation of, of the environment. And so these concerns in the sort of late 60s and um, early 70s start to emerge in her, in her work. And so the painting that you mentioned, um, Nature Strip, which is image 21, it's an incredibly important um, painting that's in the Glen Ira City Council collection. And it shows this sort of fantasy garden scene gradually being obliterated into just a black void. And it's a really kind of confronting reminder of um, what fate we might all befall if we don't acknowledge our impact um, and take proper action. But during research for the book, we actually found a really interesting precursor to this painting. And it's in the Art Gallery of New South Wales collection. And it's a smaller um, five panel study and it's, clearly informs this painting, but it's actually showing um, the imagery in an abstract form. And it was one of four works that um, were gifted to the Art Gallery of New South Wales by the writer Patrick White. And he shared a similar conviction for protecting the environment as Erica, and they were actually correspondents um, on and off over a number of years. And I think that's what the, the papers that Heidi revealed that Erica was very much um, 
in contact with a number of um, a number of interesting people at that time and actively um, in conversation with them about key kind of social, environmental or, or political issues. Thanks, Linda. And just a reminder to our audience today to st start posting your questions on our YouTube chat. And if you could address your questions to Linda and Norman, and we'll attempt to address the questions at the end of the conversation today. So um, 1975 was a really significant year for Erica's career. She was introduced to feminism when renowned American activist and feminist Lucy Lippard visited her studio in Caulfield. She co-founded the Women's Art Register in Melbourne in 75. And then during this period, embroidery became her preferred medium, evolving from her concerns that mi migrant decorative or domestic textiles were undervalued. Then can you talk about the importance of feminist issues on Erica's creative practice and her dedication to feminist concerns? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 1975, um, Erica described that as a watershed year for her. She was when she first became involved in the women's art movement. And as you said, Diane, it was Lucy Lippard who kickstarted that for her when she visited Australia for International Women's Year. And Lucy um, came to Melbourne on a side trip and did some tours, some studio tours of women artists only. So she she did that in an act of positive discrimination. And one of the studios she visited was Erica's. Um, and then Erica attended the impromptu slideshow that Lucy Lippert held at the Ewing Gallery, which is now a legendary event. And, um, and at that slideshow, Lippert showed hun um, images of hundreds of, of works by women artists, many of whom Erica had never seen before but she could recognize this common visual language and it really helped her to clarify um, her own creative uh, trajectory up to that point. And ultimately the slideshow prompted Erica and three other audience members, so Leslie Dumbrell, uh, Kitty Rubo and Meredith Rogers to set up um, a slide registry in Melbourne. And that is the Women's Art Register, which still operates out of the Richmond Library today. And they began to compile a comprehensive um, information resource on women's art in Australia. And so Erica channeled a lot of her energy into this um, initiative for the next 10 or so years. Um, and in a way that meant less time for her in the studio. But as is often the case, when you have less time, more opportunities seem to come along. And so, Erica's engagement with the women's art movement really reinvigorated her career and um, sort of gave her this new sense of purpose and direction. And this idea of female imagery, which Lippert had helped to define for her, started to inform her own artwork and particularly the materials employed in her work. So you mentioned her use of embroidery and she really started to reevaluate and revive her love of needlework at that time. And it did become her sort of preferred medium in the 1980s and 1990s. And she found that um, really liberating and empowering. So if we look at these images, um, so images 26 through to 29 and 30, um, you can see um, these textile works and they reference um, her love of um, decorative art and so all kinds of idioms. So from folk art to patterns that you might find in domestic textiles or rugs and tablecloths. And they're incredible works. I mean, they're just exquisite. They have these electric kind of colorways. And I, whenever I've seen them, I've always marveled at how she can actually create such a striking abstract design in thread. <clears throat> um, but, I guess she was treating these works with the same seriousness as her paintings and drawings of the time. So for her, they were also a feminist statement. And it was a statement about trying to break down that distinction between high art and low art. Thanks, Linda. And so 79 was also an interesting year for Erica. She was commissioned by the Victorian Ministry for the Arts to paint a Melbourne tram. Can you talk about this important commission and the theme she explored in the design? 
Yes, so if we can look at image 32, um, you can see the visual links um, between the embroideries we just looked at and the geometric scheme that Erica conceived for her tram design. Um, so she was one of several contemporary artists who were given the honor of these um, new um, commissions. Um, again, another major public art commission that she was awarded. And she wanted her design to be eye-catching and cheerful. She wanted to kind of alleviate the dreariness of urban life, as she described it. Um, but her key aim, again, was to make a social statement. And so she based her composition on a patchwork quilt design. And that was to acknowledge the undervalued achievements of so many anonymous women who have expressed themselves in needlework. And so she actually included a formal acknowledgement on a plaque um, addressing the subject of um, her design and also acknowledging the help of all, all of the people who assisted her with the painting. So this photograph shows her at work in the Preston Tramways workshop. And it took her and a team of helpers about five weeks um, to finish the commission. And she built up a really strong camaraderie with the tramway workers as well. So she chose to keep the same hours of work as them as a sort of sign of solidarity for the workers, which again, just kind of um, symbolizes her, I guess, just her sense of social, um, her social consciousness. And for her, I remember her saying that one of the most um, sort of enjoyable parts of that commission was the opportunity to collaborate and get to know other people. Thanks, Linda. And now moving uh, along to 1995 and Erica's last painting, Ribbons and Rimples, which is represented in Heidi Museum of Modern Arts collection. This was also an important year as the Caulfield Arts Centre staged a major survey exhibition of Erica's work, Artist, Feminist, Humanist, which honoured the career of this really important artist. So can you talk a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so this, um, this is actually the final painting that Erica created. And uh, so she chose to retire in 1995 because for her, it felt like the right time. Um, and so this work really fuses that feminine sensibility or, or female imagery that she started to work on after meeting Lucy Lippard. And it sort of fuses that with that, the organic processes that uh, Norman was talking about in her 1950s abstract works, because a lot of those works do start from accidental beginnings, as Norman was explaining. And so um, when I met Erica, when I was working and um, I was developing an exhibition for Heidi Museum of Modern Art, um, and that was really the beginning of my research on her work. Um, and I went to visit her at her home studio and she showed me this painting and, and described how she'd used the tonal patches of a newspaper clipping, seen kind of through half closed eyes to start the composition. And that was um, a kind of tool that she would sometimes use. So she'd use these kind of little viewfinders to find an interesting abstract composition and then work the painting from there. And as she was explaining that to me, she kind of she pulled out the news clipping from behind the painting itself. So she was um, an exceptional archivist in terms of documenting not only in the way that she made her work, but also her many achievements. And so the clipping um, is now part of the archive at Heidi because Erica went on to donate um, many of her own works and also her professional and personal papers to Heidi Museum. Thanks, Linda. And now, before we conclude today's conversation, I'll ask you first, Norman, and then Linda, to summarise Erica's creative accomplishments and what you think is her most important artistic legacy in terms of her career and her contribution to the cultural life of Australia. I'll go first. Yeah, thanks, Norman. Okay. Well, I, I think throughout her um, artistic career, she gave to ballet, to graphic design, to theatre designs, um, to representational art, and was a master of abstract. When the world, world she was engaging in the same time, 
she was engaging in, in this, this artistic wonderment and executed them in a worldly, brilliant manner. Um, the, the, she, she deserves um, her due recognition as a great Australian artist. And unfortunately, I don't think she has got the due deserve that she should, should get. Um, I hope that uh, the younger generation and the younger generation of, uh, of curators, um, young Australian, I, I, I want to say this, young Australian curators should tell, tell us and the world about artists we don't know, not only about artists that we do know about, especially curators from, from, uh, from major galleries. It is most important that artists like Erica McGilchrist are given the mantle that she deserves because her work is here, her score is there, let everybody see it. It, it, it's, it runs from the 50s and it runs to, to the 90s and it stands up on its own now. Thanks, Norman. And Linda, would you like to add to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Erica received an order of uh, Australian medal for her contributions, not only to the Women's Art Register, but also to visual culture in Australia. And that was um, in 1992, about three years before she retired. But I think there was definitely a period where she had slipped from public consciousness. And there are a number of reasons why, and we don't have time <laughs> to fully discuss all of those. And I feel like even our conversation today, it really just sort of breaks the surface of Erica's achievements. Like it, and Norman just said, she was not only an artist and teacher, but she was involved in, in graphic commissions, ballet and um, set and costume design and graphic design. Her, her career just has so many different facets and all of them done with great integrity and creativity. But for me, I think her creative accomplishments, if I was to summarize it, they, they extend way beyond what is purely visible in the artworks um, that she's left behind or the documentation of the artworks that we have. Because I think what she also did was to create opportunities that um, through her actions and through her decisions to support artists of, of future generations. So a live example would be the Women's Art Register, which is continuing to thrive. It researches and positions historical women artists and it, and it builds opportunities for contemporary artists to exhibit and to collaborate and to document their achievements and put them on the public record. And another live example is the bequest that she left to Heidi Museum, which is used to support exhibitions and publications about the work of Australian women artists. So for me, you know, Erica was not an artist who was striving for art stardom or accolades, but she, she first and foremost wanted her art and her, her career to have a positive impact on society and the collective. And, you know, one of the last things she actually said to me when, um, when I, the last visit I made to her home was that she hoped to be remembered as an activist as much as an artist. Mm. Thanks, Linda. And she also made a significant donation to Glenara City Council's art collection, which we're really grateful for. And we've seen many of those images today and also many works from Heidi Museum's collection mm -hmm. and many other public collections and private collections, including Norman's. So, and I was fortunate to meet Erica in my role as curator at the Council Gallery and I have very fond memories of talking to her in the gallery about different exhibitions. And I found her such an engaging and interesting artist and person. Um, and her direct engagement with feminist issues and environmental issues is something that I really remember. Um, and yeah, I think she was incredibly talented. So, um, We've got some audience, some questions from the audience now, which I'll bring up on the screen. So the first question is a question about the uh, stamp. So the stamp commission in 67. So she received a commission to design the Australian airmail Christmas stamp. 
Linda, can you talk a bit about the stamp? I can, yes. Yeah. So um, Erica um, received a commission from the forerunner of Australia Post, um, the Postmaster General's Department, to design a Christmas stamp. Um, and it was the first time an, a visual artist had been asked to design the stamp instead of a graphic designer. And that was really reflective of, I guess, this sort of new contemporary art scene and, and public awareness about contemporary contemporary art was on, on the rise. Um, and Erica created a very interesting design. Um, it was sort of, again, using, it shows her, her interest in combining these very high key kind of colorways and graphic sort of hard edge um, forms. And she, because she wasn't a religious person, but she did have an incredible interest in spirituality and faith. She decided to, rather than to take the kind of a Christian theme, she incorporated a number of religious icons into it's almost like a mandala design. A mandala design. Um, I wish we had an image because it's quite hard to describe. But again, it just showed this real sort of level of sophistication in the way that she approached the commission and um, her depth of thinking towards the theme and what it could represent for all people and not just one group of people who had a particular religious belief. And it also looked to what was happening and you know, it was kind of cutting edge. It really set a new benchmark for stamp design. Mm. Yes, it was quite an innovative design, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, for, its, for that time. Uh, we've got another question from the audience. So uh, is Erica's studio home still standing and what is the location in Caulfield? I don't think I can give out the address of the studio, but no, we can't. Um, what Erica did was um, she always worked from home. And so she always turned a room of her home into her studio. And she did that in Germany as well, actually. She decided she didn't want to go into the Academy studios. And so she, she painted from, from the house that she was living in. And that was partly because of her shyness and she felt she hadn't grasped the language that she actually had. She had a great facility for language, but she often worked um, in that way. She was definitely a solitary painter. And so her studio um, at, in her Caulfield home was just one of her front rooms. And then she transformed her dining area into her classroom. And so at the time when I was visiting Erica, because she was very much involved in the development of the exhibition she had at Heidi, um, her studio was still set up with all of her painting racks um, and her classroom was more or less still set up as well. She still had all of her materials um, and tables in there. Thanks, Linda. And Norman, it's a question for you. So as a collector of Australian art, can you elaborate on perhaps your role as a collector in recognising the value that artists bring to communities? and creating renewed interest in artists like Erica and other under-recognized artists? Well, as I said before, um, it's, a, it's, all, it's all very, it, I find it exceedingly difficult to understand why um, uh, we don't um, do what I, what I, what I say is uh, mining in art. Um, there's many treasures to find and, um, it seems to be that we all go, it's like going to the supermarket. Yeah, and a lot of the curators just go to the supermarket and grab the brand that uh, will bring the people in. It's much uh, harder to uh, um, um, see the treasures you find and put them on the wall and put them in our theatres, which I, the gallery theatres, and bring the public and show them, show them what treasures artists, especially in the 50s and the 60s, this country produced that were worldly. They, they were right on to what was going on. I won't say that they were the instigators, but they were right, right with what was going on in certain instances in New York and what was in the 50s and what was going on after New York. So it, it takes a lot more effort 
and a lot more um, brilliant as a curator to show, to dig up gems and find new flowers. Um, and, I, and I feel that we're let down in Australia. We're still mesmerised by all the international um, um, big names, which I understand. That's part of it. But don't forget that there are others that there are other people in the art world, in the art family, that deserve um, people to see their beauty with their own eyes. Thanks, Norman. Uh, we've got another question that's come through from the audience. So did Erica make her stunning embroideries and did she create any works of the tapestry workshop later on? Not that I'm aware of. No. 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 I don't think there is anything at the tapestry workshop. Tapestry I don't workshop, no. 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 And There should have been, but uh, there's not. Yeah, there should have been, yeah. <laughs> And another question about Erica's engagement with feminism. Uh, if you could perhaps talk a bit more, Linda, about her role as a, a mentor for young female artists who are working at the time and emerging during the period that Erica was alive and how this was reinfor reinforced by her involvement with the Women's Art Register and the net their networks. Yeah, so I think, I think one of the most rewarding elements of Erica's involvement in the in feminism and the women's art movement was the fact that she was introduced as a mixing with a much younger generation of artists. Um, it was a cross generational um, thing, and and so she was. Um, I mean, I, I don't have any specific examples that I can give about particular artists that she mentored, but um, I do know that some of our audience members will know this because we know Erica through the Women's Art Register. And I might just default to say that in the publication that's been produced by Heidi and Lovell Chen, there is an excellent essay that's written by Dr. Juliet Piers. And Juliet has an encyclopedic knowledge of um, women's art in Australia and internationally. And she writes, um, her focus is on Erica's involvement in the Women's Art Register and her interaction with other collectives like the LIP Collective, so the Feminist Art Journal and the Women's Art Forum as well. And I think um, rather than me cobble together a not very satisfactory answer, I'd highly recommend reading um, Juliet's text. Yeah, and I agree. Juliet's text is really interesting and really informative and engaging. So it gives you a greater insight, I think, into Erica's engagement with feminist concerns. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's fabulous. Another question that's come through about Erica's creative practice and did she work collaboratively with other artists or engage other people to work with her? during her career? Not a lot. No, I can't, I'm just, other than working on, when she was working on some of her commissions, mm. but she didn't, um, she was involved in large kind of collaborative exhibitions and, and festivals, but she never co-created a work that I can think of. Um, she really was quite solitary in her approach to making art, you know, up until her involvement in the Women's Art Register. Norman, do you know of any? Well, the, 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 my favorite, one of my favorite works is the works that Meadmore did the frames and, yeah. and Erica did the drawings. Um, mm. You could say that's a collaborative work, um, I but I don't know of many others. Can I just mention before we go, but I'm going to show you this. This is an I can't. Don't know if you can see it, but that 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 is a marvelous um, um, account of Erica's work that that um, has been written by Linda, and and it is well worth buying. It's available at Heidi, and um, anybody that's watching that wants to understand and love Erica's works more should get that book. Mm. Thanks, Norman. 
I agree. It's a really fascinating publication and well, really gives you a greater insight into Erica's career and creative life. So I think that brings us to the end of our conversation today. Um, I'd like to thank Linda and Norman for your participation. It's been a fantastic conversation. So thank you both. And I'd like to thank Nick Scown and the estate of Erica McGilchrist, Kendra Morgan and Svetlana Matovsky, Heidi Museum of Modern Art for their support with the images included in today's conversation. Caroline Phillips and the team at the Women's Art Register Leo Damiani and the Council's Arts and Culture team. A reminder to everyone to please give us your feedback about today's online conversation. The conversation was streamed live today and this along with many of the images and photographs viewed today can be viewed on the Council's YouTube channel on our website. So please share this with your friends and family. I'd like to promote our next Sunday afternoon online event, which is a Japanese Koto concert with local musician Brandon Lee. So that's next Sunday, September the 13th at three o'clock. We look forward to your participation next week. Thank you all for joining us today. It's been a fantastic conversation and hopefully an ongoing conversation about Erica McGilchrist's important career and contribution to our cultural life. So thanks again, Linda and Norman, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs>